Okay, well, welcome everybody. And on behalf of the Professional and Career Development Services and the Office of Community Engaged Learning, welcome to our second season of Careers and Social Change panel series. I'm Amanda Martin. I'm the Assistant Director of Community Engaged Learning here on campus, and I'll be the moderator tonight. And my colleague, Crystal Stanley, will be checking the chat box for questions and calling on people to ask questions as well. So today we are modeling our panel series off of the Pathways for Civic Action and Social Change, which is a framework that helps us understand various paths for getting involved in service, community, and social change activities. We're fortunate to be joined this evening by Aubrey Alvarez, Executive Director of Eat Greater Des Moines, Christine Herr, Executive Director of Art Force Iowa, Amber Lynch, Executive Director of Invest DSM, and EJ Wallace, the Iowa State Manager for Save the Children Action Network. So just a couple of housekeeping tips before we start. Uh, to minimize distraction for everyone and also just to help with our network capacity, we're going to ask today that just our panelists use their video. Uh, unless you are asking a question later and want to turn your camera on, that's just fine. Same with um, audio, if you could please mute yourselves unless you are speaking. If you're just joining us, uh, please share your name, major, and year in the chat box so we can get to know who all is here. Um, you can also check check the chat box this evening. We'll be putting a couple links to different things in there too. And then questions. Uh, the panelists want to hear from you all. So please be putting your questions either in the chat box or you can raise your virtual hand and we'll call on you. Um, so be thinking, we'll have them introduce themselves here in a second. Be thinking of what you want to know from these amazing community leaders. We are recording the panel, as I said, so you may watch it again or share it with your friends who are not able to attend. And you can also find our previous panels that we've had um, with other great guests um, on drake.edu slash career slash events. All right, so moving on to the good stuff. It's universally understood that volunteerism is good and a needed part of social change, but often we forget that there are amazing career opportunities that spur social change. This Careers and Social Change series focuses on those careers. And tonight our focus is on community organizing and activism. So I'm gonna ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about their roles and background and what drew them to their involvement in this career. So let's start with Aubrey. Who are you? A little bit about what you do and why are you interested in this career? Well, well, hi, I'm Aubrey Alvarez. Um, I am the executive director and co-founder of Eat Greater Des Moines. And I will say I consider myself an accidental nonprofit co-founder. Um, I did have the opportunity. I grew up in Southwest Iowa and I had got my undergrad from University of Northern Iowa in health promotion and initially planned on working um, like many. I went to UNI first to be a teacher and then realized that both my parents were teachers. So that's really all I knew. I didn't really know. I didn't even know the word actuarial probably until maybe 10 years ago. So um, ended up changing my major to health promotion and thought I would work in corporate wellness for a while. And I did. That's how I ended up in Des Moines. Um, I worked in corporate wellness at Principal Financial Group. And while I was there, um, knew I wanted to kind of just diversify what my opportunities were. At the time, many people kind of looked at me only as an aerobics instructor, which mind you, I can teach aerobics and I did and would still, um, but really enjoyed kind of making more of the connections between when people feel better, they also work better. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons why we want people to um, invest in their health. So making some of those connections was what I found I really enjoyed. And I did end up getting my master's in public administration from Drake University. And that's also why um, I realized there's a lot more to running a nonprofit than maybe I had understood. And um, so didn't necessarily intend to be running a nonprofit, yet here we are. So um, I took a job as a local food coordinator and now nailing it, I guess we're just um, 
figuring it, it all out. Now E Greater Des Moines started in 2013 and now we are a team of three full-time. We actually have a part-time um, communications intern who is a Drake student and Emily Postlewaite. And we have right now four part-time food rescue drivers and are looking to hire more. So in uncharted waters, but I'm loving it. Awesome. I can attest to that you're nailing it. So thanks, Aubrey. Let's go on to Amber. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Amber Lynch, and I'm the executive director of Invest DSM. Um, and in some ways, similar to Aubrey, I, I never really set out to be the executive director of a nonprofit. It was um, also a little bit of an accident, um, but maybe the product of other things that I was doing. So um, what I went to college at Luther up in Northeast Iowa in Decorah. And when I was there, really probably didn't know what I wanted to do for a career. Um, I ended up majoring in Spanish, uh, partly because I fulfilled the language requirement after one semester and I enjoyed that class a lot and I had a professor that said, hey, if you do a minor in Spanish, um, I'm taking a trip to Peru next J term and, and you should go. Um, so I did that and um, just ended up really enjoying the travel. Uh, so I switched to majoring in Spanish so that I could then do a semester abroad. I tried to pair it with a number of different things, everything from teaching to social work to um, business and landed on anthropology as kind of a secondary major. Um, but still, although I loved both of those subjects academically, um, there wasn't really anything in, that, in either of them that appealed to me as far as a career went. Um, so I graduated, I moved up to the Twin Cities, I worked for a couple of years, and I thought, well, I can always go back to school when I figure it out. Um, so I, you know, after a few years, started looking at graduate programs. Um, I was still trying to hang on to that Spanish degree and figure out what to do with it. I felt a really strong sense of obligation to see that through. Um, and I found a Latin American studies program that was paired with urban planning. Uh, and the more I looked at the urban planning compo component, the more it was like, what, this is a profession? I had no idea. There are people in the world that do this. Um, and so I, I started talking with people. I started researching it more and finally realized that just for me, pursuing anything with the Spanish language beyond what I had already done, it, it wasn't the path I wanted to go down. So I had to let go of that a little bit. Um, and I started pursuing planning. I ended up at Iowa State, so I got my master's in community and regional planning at Iowa State. Um, and while I was there, sat in on a course where a planner from the city of Des Moines was talking about their neighborhood revitalization program. Um, so I went up to her after the class and I said, hey, do you have any internships this summer? And she said, no, we don't have any money to pay interns. Um, and I said, OK, well, what if I worked for free? Because I really just want to get to know what you do. Um, so it was, I was, you know, in a fortunate position where I had a research assistantship with a professor. So I was getting paid um, for part-time work there and, and I was able to spend some volunteer hours um, working for the city of Des Moines that summer um, and got to know what, what they did uh, in their neighborhood revitalization program. Kind of got my foot in the door, um, was hired back after I graduated um, as an intern first, and then moved into an assistant planner position, um, and then was there for 10 years. Um, so I was an assistant planner and then a senior planner for the city of Des Moines, all kind of in the landscape of neighborhood development. Um, Aubrey and I actually worked together on a couple of projects. And um, we uh, did some reframing of that program uh, back in 2017. Um, and one of the things that came out of that program evaluation and, and kind of reframe for the city of Des Moines was creating a new nonprofit that could take um, neighborhood plans that could that were put together by the city and then actually be in charge of their implementation. Um, so in some ways, I'm really uh, and our organization at Invest DSM, we're, we're kind of project managing the change that has been envisioned through a public process. Um, 
And so I started that two and a half years ago. I'm also the, the founding executive director. So we've been here from day one and um, have learned a lot over the roller coaster of the last couple of years about how to build an organization and how to manage staff and um, and also how to continue doing what I'm passionate about, which is you know creating positive change in our community. So I'll leave it there for now um, and we can come back to anything you want with questions. Great, thanks Amber. How about Christine? Hey everyone. Ooh, the video just spotlighted me and my head's so big. I'm gonna go back to gallery view. Give me a second, I gotta adjust. Um, my name is Christine. I'm executive director of Art Force Iowa. I'm a Des Moines native. I'm a Drake grad as well. So I take that to heart here. Um, I originally came to Drake as supposed to be a pharmacy uh, student because that's what my parents wanted. And I was like, oh, no, I'm happy I'm on the wait list. I'm going to go for another science that I like. So I uh, double majored and said I, was, I would do chemistry and biochem, cell molecular biology. And then I did a semester of that. And I was like, what am I doing? Oh my gosh, this is so stupid. Um, I don't like this. This is not where I wanna be, not what I wanna do. Um, and then I changed my major and I think my spring semester of sophomore year, still graduated on time, which is a miracle. Um, but I got my degrees in um, my bachelor's in creative writing, philosophy and political science. So it's a weird bunch of stuff. Um, it's a buffet for me. And I think it's really great to have different options and opportunities. Um, I knew that I wanted to be an executive director of a nonprofit. When I was 16 years old, I was very fortunate that I had other Asian women who were leading their own nonprofits in Des Moines. And I was like, I want to do that. I think this would be super kick-ass to have a nonprofit that supports young people who don't have access to the arts. Um, I grew up as a musician and my mom and dad would be like, girl, you better stop playing guitar and you need to read a book. You need to go study. And so for me, I was like, I want to create a space where young people like myself who have parents who don't want them to do the arts can do the arts together. Um, I had no idea when I would get there or how I would get there. But after I graduated from Drake, I started working at the Office of Asian and Pacific Islander Affairs. And I was helping refugees and immigrants legally adjust their um, green card statuses. And that was really fun. Um, but you know, I had a serious mental health crisis and I knew that I needed to not be in Des Moines. And so I left to Texas and was like, I'm gonna focus on my creative writing because I'm not doing any of that. I'm gonna focus on my music because I'm not doing any of that. And then eight months later, um, a previous job of mine called and said, Christine Her, we need you to come back to work full time. And I was like, okay, cool, because I have to pay all my student loans back from Drake. So this is a great time for me to come back home. And so I did, and I started working at a market research firm and we had different clients from tequila to Hillary Clinton to Pepsi. And for those of you who don't know, market research is basically putting a whole bunch of focus groups together and finding out what products people like better. What language do people resonate with better? And then I was like, I don't, care about that. I don't care what brand of Depends people like better. Uh, I don't care what kind of vodka people like better. I don't want to do this. So then I started, uh, I quit that job and I went to the Des Moines Register and was supposed to be a community content specialist. So that meant I got to write different articles about the community, really build a bridge from the community to the newsroom. Um, and then I was like, man, this this is not aligned with my purpose either because I know I want to work with young people and I know I want to work in the art world with young people. And so I quit that job and for like three years on the time span of three years together, I wasn't working for about a year. And I was like, oh, I can't tell my mom and dad because they would be very mad. And I want to handle this in my way. 
And so I was a part-time artist mentor at Art Force Iowa. And then I was hired on full-time. And then a year after being a full-time um, program manager, I became executive director. Um, and so that's where I am. Art Force Iowa has the mission to create opportunities for youth to transform through art. So I get to work with young people who identify as refugee immigrant, young people who are involved in the court system, whether it's juvenile court or family court. And I get to work with young people who are labeled as bad and delinquent in the classroom, which we know not to be true. So I love what I get to do. And um, I make art every day and do the financial fun stuff that I know all of us executive directors really love doing. Um, but I'm, I'm here to answer any question that you have. Please know I'm an open book with anything. Awesome. Thank you, Christine. And then let's hear from EJ. Hello, uh, EJ Wallace. I am currently the Iowa State Manager with Save the Children Action Network, but that is not where I started. <laughs> I started, like most of us, we have a lot of different experiences, um, you know, different paths that got us to where, uh, where I was. And so I'd actually really encourage, um, because I've really enjoyed seeing a couple of students put their, um, put their majors in there. I'm really curious as to what, you know, different majors are represented in this group. And so if you haven't yet, please, you know, put down in the chat your um, your name and your major, or just your major, um, and it, I think that'd be really interesting uh, to reflect on afterwards. Um, I started like a lot of people that do social justice work uh, with a really strong sense that the world wasn't right. Um, I was a kid of a single mom. I you know I realized that things that were a lot easier with two parent households were not easy for us. Um, the glass ceiling was extremely apparent to me when I was growing up. She was a very capable woman, um, very strong woman, um, but uh, she just couldn't get high enough um, based off of her own qualifications. She had to like, you know, cut corners, shake the right hand, talk to the right person and really play in a world that was geared towards men. Um, and so I really wanted to do something about that at a very young age. Uh, I didn't really know exactly what that was going to entail. Um, I was I went to Des Moines Area Community College, met a sociology professor there um, that told me about this thing called sociology, the study of social problems and issues. And I was like, wait, people can study this stuff? The things that I like actually experienced as a as as a kid. Um, and they told me that Drake would be a really great uh, school to to go to. I didn't wait for any financial aid. I took on all the loans and <laughs> went directly into Drake. I'm still paying those off, so hopefully other folks haven't made that that uh, similar issue. Uh, Aubrey's like me. Uh, um, I so um, you know through my process of Drake uh, giving me um, a lot of different experiences. I really focused on my academics so I can learn as much as possible. I actually interned with a um, community-based um, nonprofit activist organization, and. Uh, learned the value of what was called community organizing. I was set in a campaign to help protect the north, the north side of, of Iowa um, from losing its only source of grocery, um, from the only grocery store in the area. Um, and we won. And it was amazing. I couldn't believe that you could take people that were directly impacted by an issue like myself um, or other communities that were mostly underrepresented or undervalued um, and they could speak to press, they could talk to lawmakers, and they could make the change. And that's what I said. I said, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that for my, for my life. Um, I graduated, and I graduated in 2009. It was right after the financial crisis. Nobody was hiring. Nonprofits were just hemorrhaging people at that time. Um, and I found out uh, a lesson that I hope that everybody here learns, and that nobody cared what my GPA was. They didn't care that I was a, um, that I had a, uh, that I was an honor, sociological honor society. They cared about like where I volunteered and what projects I was in, that I was in charge of and what real life experience um, that I needed, that I needed to have. Um, but there were no opportunities like that for me. I needed to find ways to get experience um, through a couple through a lot of um, expanded reasons, we ended up in, uh, my wife and I ended up in Honolulu, Hawaii. She was going to go to school there. Um, she went to school there. And I found organized labor uh, at that time uh, when I was living there. You know, um, hotels are an incredible backbone of that industry, right? And it's a very union-friendly um, state. 
and the the union was helping people that, that were like my mom strong women patriarchs in the family speak with their collective voice and hold some of the largest corporations goldman sachs blackstone um, hilton um, accountable uh, for the working conditions um, and i said i want to be a part of that so and i'm not re i'm not recommending that you do this but this is what i did um, i found out that they were going to be doing uh, they were asking people for volunteers a couple of weeks after that, they decided that they were going to do some civil disobedience, and I got arrested um, as you know, in a line of of my um, uh, 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 hotel worker brothers and sisters. Um, we blocked the street, one of the busiest streets in Waikiki. Uh, I got sent to sent to jail. Um, ended up get, getting out thanks to the union, um, and I volunteered for almost six months with no pay, no prospect for anything. I just said, I'm going to work for you and you're going to hire me whenever I get an opportunity. I ended up getting a two month, two and a half month um, temporary position opportunity to uh, be the executive director's assistant. So like handling his uh, handling his his uh, his calendar, making appointments, things like that. They ended up liking me so much that five years later, I was still working there and I did two different jobs through that process building up my resume and experience, working with the international efforts and international union, um, and really just being hungry for opportunities um, that I wasn't, that I didn't pursue, um, and I should have pursued in, in college. Um, about, you know, at the end of that five years, my wife and I um, welcomed our son into the world, and there is no way in H double hockey sticks that you're going to be able to raise a kid on a union organizer salary in Honolulu. Um, so we moved back to be closer to friends um, and family here in Iowa, where I was from. Um, and uh, and right afterwards, I'm like, what do I do? I don't want to give up this dream of of working. Um, and I also have this uh, this this different sort of perspective on what my role is in the world. Um, you have to re really uh, people really gotta gotta keep an eye and a pulse on that. Your life experiences may change the direction of your career. Um, but it continues. It can. It can continue to um, invest in the the kind of place that you want to be and the kind of thing that you want to do. So um, I I uh, I found that there was an organization that was building a grassroots uh, um, issue based um, advocacy. Save the children. Um, they started Save the Children Action Network 2014 when I moved. Uh, when I moved back, um, I actually through one of my classes at Drake we had. A, um, a professor that invited a community organizer to speak to his group, um, uh, Amos, some people may know, uh, Amelia Iowa Organizing Strategy. Um, they didn't have anybody in mind at that point, but they, they ended up posting the, the position. I'm gonna give a quick shout out to Crystal Stanley because after I moved back, I'm like, Drake, help me. <laughs> and I asked her to help me like, you know, figure out how do I monitor uh, career opportunities. She ended up helping me catch wind of this. Um, I got interviewed and I was one of their first field hires. And now what I get to do is I get to identify, recruit, train volunteer leaders across the state um, to hold policymakers accountable for children. You know, we do this by advocating for high quality early learning, ending childhood hunger in the U.S. and, and, the, and the safety of children arriving at the southern U.S.-Mexico border, um, as well as educating and protecting children around the world. Um, and so what we, what I started off as was trying to figure out how to change the world um, ended up being something where I, um, you know, was able to leverage my experience um, that I volunteered with uh, through, uh, through my job, um, or through, my, through my life that kind of took me in a random place, and then also reconnecting with my, my college home to try to find opportunities out there. Great, thank you. Well, the amount of knowledge and experience in this Zoom call is pretty astounding to me. And I wanna go ahead and just open it up right away to our students for what questions you may have. And again, you can put it in the chat box or you can raise your hand um, because I know people have questions for these leaders. We have people um, who are directors of organizations and out there doing the work on the ground level and um, advocating, going to the Capitol. We talked a little bit about that before people got here. So. What do you want to know from these people?
what was that experience like um to advocate at the capitol like what like prompted that to like for you to like go out there and like i mean i i heard you like say like you got arrested and all that like what was that experience like like i know like a lot of people say we got arrested but like like what, what was going on through there and who is that sorry i, I can't uh read. hello i guess i should introduce myself my name is brian Oriana. i'm a junior here studying secondary education and math education well, I, I've been somebody that I, I know it looks like I speak really well and, and everything like that. It's actually, I hate most of the stuff that I ask volunteers to do, uh, but I do it because I, um, I think it's important. And, and the part that I forgot to mention is that it's not about me anymore and it's not about my mom, it's about my kid. And I would do anything to make sure the world is better for him. Um, talking to lawmakers and practicing that allowed me to see that uh, lawmakers are, are just like you and me. Um, they're regular people and they ended up and ends up being where they work for us. And so as long as I can keep that mind that in my mind, I can talk to them all day and I can hold them accountable. Um, I just, you know, part organizing really is doing scary stuff because it's important. Um, getting arrested was a, a huge extension of that for me because there was a way, a clear way at the at that point in time for me to put my politics into practice. Um, I don't know if I would do that right now, maybe if it was for the right cause. Um, but, you know, again, it was putting my politics into practice. Awesome. Thank you. Does anybody else want to speak to not necessarily the getting arrested part, but anything else that Brian asked there? <laughs> well, I can um, kind of speak to that too. I don't know. EJ, you might have been at the Capitol today. I think I saw you there. Um, so I, saw you too. I didn't want to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> I will say um, it's not my favorite place to be at all. Um, it really like drains me emotionally, but kind of like EJ mentioned, I also recognize that that's where change has to conversations need to happen. And, you know, so um, I've made the commitment to myself just going once a week and having conversations with legislators and really just um, asking questions. I think that's really been how I approach all of our work is asking, you know, where are we with this? You mentioned that, you know, for example, there was a farm to table task force that was convened over the summer really to talk about supply chain issues and, you know, what are we doing locally to make sure, um, I think, you know, the food system was one of those places, again, where there were, it feels like, you know, too big to fail. And then they did. So, you know, trying to use, sorry, I have a kitten that's trying to <laughs> get up on me. Um, so, you know, using those opportunities to go in and just ask more questions to say, where are we going from here and what's happening? And, um, you know, for me, a lot too has been asking how did some of these things like the beef checkoff or, you know, places where investments are going right now, how did they get started? You know, none of those came out of nowhere, but, you know, kind of going back to um, having some conversations and like EJ said, it, they're just regular people. I'm not showing up in a suit and a tie. I'm also showing up authentically as myself. And so chit chatting is how I ended up connecting with a senator that I wouldn't have talked to just because I talked to anyone who's near me. So um, I really think the biggest thing has just been going and doing kind of like EJ said, the uncomfortable thing, because that's sometimes the hardest part is just getting there. And then once I'm there, then I just, you know, got to make that walk up the hill worth it. I see we do have a question in the chat box from Jack saying, for any organization that aims to make a legitimate social impact, what do you think is the one key ingredient to achieving that? I will kick things off. Um, I think one of the ways that we've approached work is we just do it. There are certain like a lot of times, especially within white supremacy culture, there's this like, you have to do it this way or there's perfection. And there's so many, like, how are you supposed to do this? And instead of just doing it, like, so that's been, um, for some of the work we've been doing within food rescue, you know, just getting in and kind of following where it leads. And that's led most recently to just putting in community refrigerators. You know, where are people, we'll just put in a fridge and let people have it and not, 
worry so much about like, well, are you supposed to do this? Is this allowed? You know, what if someone takes too much? So what? So what? You know, that's fine. Um, so, you know, I think that's been probably one of the biggest, the scariest parts, especially if you're doing stuff that um, maybe hasn't been done before or goes against, you know, unfortunately there are many in the hunger space that uh, don't like this approach of just giving people food, which boggles my mind. But also, you know, I think that is the part two of, um, there are people who will, you know, don't want to lose their jobs, even if that does mean we alleviate hunger. So, you know, that's really for us, I try not to get caught up in the, what's the best, how do we supposed to do this and just take the best step that we know and try to be as transparent and honest about here's what we know, here's what we don't know, here's how we're going to try to approach this and work with other partners in this space who have that similar approach. You know, I'm not here to drag any other organizations along that that isn't what they, how they want to approach it. But I think being able to, you know, really approach the space as we're here to do some stuff and who wants to come along with, we've found um, a lot of just success that way. And, you know, do things, ask for forgiveness later. Sometimes that works out, sometimes it doesn't, but I'd rather start that way. Thanks. And Christine and Amber had put a few comments in the chat box answering that question too. Um, forming authentic connections, collective power and influence, calling people in with humility. Um, does anybody want to expand on your thoughts? Christine, Amber, or EJ, want to add anything? Amber, I saw you come off mute. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I just say that actually my comment in the chat was more related to what EJ was talking about at that moment than it was to the question in the chat. Um, that, you know, building building relationships at whatever level is, is kind of an important piece of this. Um, you know, to the question about one key ingredient, I, I, I kind of have to, um, I definitely think having, having passion for what you're doing is really essential to getting that message out there. Um, and also to, you know, sometimes, sometimes nonprofit or community organizing or advocacy jobs don't pay terribly well. So you have to be, have a reason <laughs> to be there beyond that paycheck. Um, and, and when you believe in what you're doing, that really comes through to other people um, and attracts them to your mission. Um, so that, and then just to tag off of what Aubrey said, I think having that willingness to take risks and to just keep trying things even if you make mistakes, even if you have to kind of backtrack and say, okay, well, we wouldn't do that again. Um, but being willing to just go in and act and do and continue to push forward, I, I think is also really critical. Yeah, and I put this in the chat, but I think a key ingredient um, as well as like one being authentic to yourself and your own passions is also uh, being uh, authentic to your own story. So really don't be afraid to leverage those stories and experiences. I always, tell, I always tell this to my volunteers. It's the one piece of power that you can that can never be taken away from you, whether you're talking to elected officials or someone in power that um, is standing in the way of the progress that you need to see. Um, what are they going to do? Say you didn't live where you lived and live the life that you did? Like, you know, they just, they can't. Um, and so don't be afraid to leverage that. And I'd also say, don't be afraid to make an ask. Um, like Margaret Mead said, uh, it never doubt a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And the only way in which that happened, if we look through back through history, a lot of the major social movements happen because of one conversation at a time. So I always tell my volunteers too, you know, if you want to invite people to, a, to take an action together, you know, and scan, that's a, what we do with our adult volunteers. We also have a club here um, at Drake. Um, but you know, you ask people to join, what's the worst thing that they're going to say? No. <laughs> and if they say no, where, how worse off are you before? So don't be afraid to make an ask and leverage your own personal story. Yeah. And I think that's such a great connection to, um, the way I answered it. Cause I, I think people as humans, we want connections, right? And when you can own your story and your experience and when you can show up authentically because here's the truth people are going to know when when you're they'll be able to call bullshit right 
and you you will be able to do that too and so if you can show up and be authentic and form those connections it's really powerful because when we're talking about social impact and social change we mean greater impact right so that that means that it can't happen in silos it can't happen by yourself one person one organization it really requires those communities coming together and i'm not saying unity i'm not saying let's do some kumbaya shit i mean like when we really come together and we say our unity is rooted in justice and equity our unity is rooted in authentic communities flourishing. Our unity is rooted in knowing that your story is true and my story is also true and they do coexist. So when we want social impact and social change, it requires all of us to get on board, right? Or most of us. And so I think making sure that you're framing the work around how do I build partnerships that are meaningful and impactful that's super important because you want this well that cat really loves to jump holy cow uh it it gives you this greater sense of knowing what that impact looks like because it's not just you and here's the thing when you do it by yourself it gets tiring you need people to lift you up in those moments when you're like wow what did i do today nothing what did i do this month nothing. So when you form these connections, they're not only there for you to make these collective change and have collective influence together, but it allows you to be in community with people who are also on that journey with you so that you're not alone, so that you don't lose sight of your purpose, right? And uh, it's so easy to get off track and to forget that you're on this journey with other people, especially as an executive director, it can be very lonely, right? So you need other people who are in those situations to stand by you um, so that you're not by yourself. And then Ellie has this question on how do your organizations reach out to local communities and spread your message? We use our social media platform so we go very hard on Facebook and Instagram. Now we're on Twitter. Uh, we've been on Twitter, but we haven't used it very much. And then the other thing is it's we make a lot of community events where we want the community to take part in knowing where our young people are com coming from. And so having these bigger community events and inviting folks to come out really helps to tell that story um, so that people can know who we are. And, you know, working with, the news outlets too and the media that's another great way to to get it out there but i'm going to spin it back to what aubrey said when you're doing the work people will see it and when you're doing the work people will will know that and that speaks for itself you can get all the publicity you want but when you're not doing the work people know i would say too kind of to that you know that's one of the challenges of um, for a while being a staff of one was that outreach and communication is not my strength. It's, I don't like it at all. So, you know, that was definitely an area that we struggled with for a while until Emily, we now our intern before um, came on board. And part of that one, you know, was me being able to say, honestly, like, that's not something I'm great at. And it is very helpful to have someone else on our team, on our board, who will do it. So, you know, I think that's a piece is don't be afraid to just step up and say you'll help. Like, again, I don't have any special knowledge and skills and when, when it comes to how to do social media and that kind of stuff. So, you know, I think there's always this um, that I've struggled with is, oh, well, do you have the experience? You know, have you done this before? None of us have, I haven't. So we have to start somewhere and I would much rather walk through this with someone else who's willing to try and figure it out and, you know, work collaboratively, then wait for me to say, here's exactly what you need to do, because I don't know. And so for a long time, the main way that our message and name got out in the community was through our partners, you know, because we, we don't serve any people directly, but firmly believe that there's enough food here for everybody. And we've just made the choice not to let anyone, like to let people be hungry. So, you know, from that standpoint, um, we know there's enough food and we just want all these groups that can use it to have it. And so that's really how a lot of our relationships have started is 
we do what we say we're going to do. And if we mess up, we'll say it. But then through those, you know, good relationships with others, they'll pass this on to more in their network and their trusted partners. So, you know, I think, and that's nothing you can do will speed that up besides just being authentic to those relationships. Because, you know, it goes both ways is if that trust has been broken, then that takes a really long time to repair. So I would much rather um, go through it being honest and authentic and see if, you know, that's how the message has spread. Um, and now we'll, we'll try doing better also, at, you know, communications and social media, but I feel like the, pe the relationships with people we have is probably our best, um, best asset. Yeah, I think that's been true for us too, Aubrey. Um, Invest DSM is a place-based organization as far as our work goes. So we have four very specific neighborhood geographies that can access our programs um, and then provide a lot of grants to property owners in those areas to, um, you know, kind of fix up their older properties. Um, so that's some of the direct service work we do. And then we do a lot of partnering around um, other things that make neighborhoods healthy. Um, so because of that, sometimes the kind of traditional methods like social media or um, uh, regular publicity get hard because we're not serving the entire community. And so then we have a lot of really disappointed people who are calling us but are not living in our geography, which is really the only eligibility criteria that we have. So we've definitely had to be a lot more um, targeted in, in using word of mouth and that client experience of, you know, if a homeowner in one of our neighborhoods has a good experience with us, they'll tell their neighbors about it. Um, we do put yard signs in front in the front yards of our projects, and we get a lot of calls based on that of people who maybe have not heard from a neighbor but are really curious about why um, five people around them have an Invest DSM sign in their yard. And what does that mean and how do they get some? Um, so those kind of ground game type things have, have probably been the most effective for us. Um, pandemic has hindered our efforts to like go to door to door. We would do more of that if we were not, um, you know, dealing with the public health issues at the moment. Um, you know, certainly we still do social media and, and, and things like that. But I agree that at least for us, that kind of word of mouth has been the most effective. Yeah, and I, I, I guess I'll, I'll give a couple examples uh, for SCAN um, about how we do our outreach. So we um, kind of, we fit people into different volunteer categories. So outreach, um, legislative, advocacy, um, media, um, and then during uh, key uh, times, we also have voter engagement. Um, and that's our, our community um, act, through different community action teams. So we have community action teams in Eastern Iowa, um, Western Iowa, and then Central Iowa um, around the around key population centers. Um, we, we, what we do is we train our advocates because I'm the only full-time permanent staff in the entire state for my organization. Everybody else is volunteers. And um, so what we do is we train them how to be a voice and actually leverage their voice in strategic ways. We teach them strategy. Um, so one great example is uh, is actually, let me, let me talk about the community outreach and let me go back to this. So the community outreach, um, a good example is our student program. So we teach students within our club um, and, and, and we're rebuilding after the pandemic right now because everybody's finally starting to do stuff in person. Uh, but we do a lot of tabling. We'll have petitions we'll have uh, that we'll collect and then deliver them to lawmakers or teach students how to do that. Um, we teach them how to run a table effectively to um, invite other people in. We teach them how to um, uh, run a student interest meetings so that they can learn how to talk about issues that they care about, um, excite their peers, and then plan action so that they can actually substantively change what's, uh, what's going on in the world. Um, and that's the kind of model that we've seen that has really um, helped people get really excited. Our um, students have gone on to be, um, you know, to work in Washington, D.C. and key lawmakers offices because of the relationships that they've built or the things that they've shared. Um, uh, kind of piggy, uh, kind of wrap around to um, getting our message out there. We can't be afraid to get our message out there to press. Um, you know, uh, I think Christine may have, have mentioned this, like leveraging, um, you know, media relationships. Um, we've taught 
child care and preschool providers how to speak in a clear, succinct way, how to build relationship with press. And what that has made uh, is so that our volunteers are, at, are on the short list of people that, um, uh, that uh, reporters will text and say, hey, we're doing a story on this thing. Um, uh, enough student, enough uh, people have gotten in the news that a National Huffington Post reporter texted me and said, hey, I'd like to do a story that involves your advocates. And so I connected them with community partners. And so it's sort of like helping get our message of our community partners out there. Because I think one thing that I think has been really exciting to hear with Aubrey, Christine, and Amber um, is that we all are very comfortable in our lanes. And I would suggest that when, when you look for an organizations to, uh, you know, to volunteer with, that they know what their, where their value add is in the community, and they're confident in that. Um, because that also helps with relationships with different organizations and help with different coalition efforts um, on a long, uh, long-term basis. Thank you very much. And you all got a wonderful compliment in the chat that this is a really insightful panel. And I would agree with that completely. We do have a question also from James that's very insightful. How do you persevere? Like what keeps you going? How, and then how do you forgive yourself when you make errors? Well, like I answered, one's behind me. I've been wallpapering a lot in my house. <laughs> so throughout the pandemic, I've kind of hopped around. I started out with macrame, then I did some cross stitch. Um, I like have to do stuff with my hands for really a lot like 2020 I couldn't read because I couldn't calm down enough to focus to read so um paint by number I've been doing you know really ways to be um creative but I I think probably two one of the biggest pieces kind of like what Christine mentioned before is just having a network of others that I can reach out to especially when I'm struggling you know and that's I think sometimes that you know it's not just everybody that you can you know let it all hang out too, but it's really nice to have that trusted group of um, peers and especially who are in the nonprofit space, you know, cause there's, it's just a little challenge. Obviously my husband has challenges at his job, um, but he works at MidAmerican and has a very different like set of resources. You know, when I was trying to figure out how to do routes for our food rescue and was, you know, figuring out how to do this. And I was using Google maps. He's like, that's not how you do this. I'm like, well, you got any better ideas or resources? So, you know, it's really helpful just to have others in the space that you can call on when you're struggling and just, you know, sometimes need a reminder of like, you are doing a good job. You are making progress. I think that's sometimes what I can get caught up in is the, like, have we done anything? Like, are we getting anywhere? Um, defeatist kind of attitude. So sometimes, you know, that's when I need to wallpaper a room and get some perspective um, so that I can not drag everyone else down with me with that attitude. Yeah, I think you make a good point, Aubrey, just taking a lot of self-care, right? and knowing what that is. Um, I have some of it here in, in writing and I think I will just expand a little bit on, you know, when you know what your purpose is, it helps you with the long game. Cause it's a long game, right? Like no matter where you go in your life, it's, it's the long game. And so if you don't know what your purpose is, don't freak out. Like no one really knows right? They, we don't really know until you explore and you experiment and you remain curious, right? And um, for me, it's just get to know what it is that you value. What are the things that you really care about? So that when you're on this search to figure out how you can make that a living, you are aligning with organizations and companies who share the similar or same values as you. Because at the end of the day, a job is a job. But when you are working at a place that aligns with your purpose and your values, it's easier to persevere. It's easier to keep moving forward when things get really hard and when you want to give up um, because you know you're made for this. And so my last thing will just be this for those of us who go camping and maybe those of us who like to build homes. You cannot build a house when you are feeling 
like shit. When you're feeling like I didn't do enough, I messed up, or I'm never going to get there, you have to build a tent. Let yourself feel it. You got to pack that tent back up. You cannot build a foundation for a home to live there. Because if you do, then you will stay there. So like, pitch it up, pack up that tent, let yourself feel it. Don't live there. Don't build a home there. Grab that tent, keep moving up. There's so much more in the mountain that you need to see. So don't build a house there. Keep, keep packing up, but let yourself feel it. Don't do yourself a disservice. Feel that, but pick it up and keep going. I got chills there. Thank you, Christine. Okay, well, for students who may be looking for their next step, their way to get involved, and maybe they've heard something from one of you that really piqued their interest, can you all share a little bit about some of the opportunities you have available uh, that maybe Drake students could get involved in or just a piece of advice you may have for them? Sure, I will, um, I'll start. So. Save the Children Action Network has a student ambassador program. Um, we have a, a that's supported in Washington DC um, and, and we have a club that we're rebuilding here on campus. Uh, but our student ambassador program is sort of an official um, role that you apply for. Um, and it has a lot of resources, including you know, our ready-made campaigns, connecting to national advocates, um, students from all over the world. Um, and if you're accepted into the program, um, not only do you get to help support the club here on campus, but you also have a chance to go to Washington, D.C. for free um, and, and, uh, and meet lawmakers, meet student ambassadors from, from across the country. Um, and, and that's a really great way to, to really put a lot of good stuff on your resume. Um, if you're interested in doing that, I'll put the link in the chat for, um, for applying. Uh, and I also put my email if that's not if you're like oh that's too much of a commitment I just kind of want to know what to do. Uh, there's all kinds of things that you can um, you can do just this week um, that can that can help be a voice for kids and I'm I'm happy to plug you into that as well. Great, thank you. Yeah, any of the panelists feel free to put um, further information, links, or social media handles, or things like that in the chat box as well. Well, I'll jump in and say, um, we'd love to see a community fridge on the Drake campus somewhere. So uh, if any of you would like to see that, you know, you're really the only ones that can do it. That's the um, kind of what we've heard from the administration is if that's something that students want and uh, students wanna bring forward, then if you can get them to say, yes, I'll buy you the fridge. And you've got food all over the place around there that could, um, really help not only students, but the neighbor, we really see these fridges as a way that just, again, it builds community and we all build community through food. And it's not necessarily about need, it's about recognizing that just, we all need food every day. And, you know, I, anytime I drop food off at um, some of the community fridges, I'll take something with me because there's really good stuff in there. So it's not meant to be something that's a stigma. It's really meant to be our vision is that you'll see food everywhere and food is for everybody. So um, that would be one way that you can um, help. Otherwise, we're always looking for volunteers if you want to go and help pick up food and deliver it to one of our um, other community fridges. But I got my eye on you, Drake. You can do it. I'll make a quick plug too. We have a food recovery program here on campus in partnership with Aubrey and Eat Greater Des Moines as well. Um, Next Course Food Recovery, where we students and volunteers pick up um, food from our dining center and take it to partner agencies. So if anybody would be interested in that, it's pretty quick, pretty easy. It only takes about 30 minutes to do. So um, feel free to get in touch if you want more information about that. Um, I can jump in. I stuck my email in the chat um, if anybody is interested in anything related to InvestSM or just curious about how you might get involved um, with city government too, because um, there's a lot of opportunities there uh, to serve on boards and commissions or you know volunteer with various departments. Um, but I would also say uh, for us that one of our four special investment districts is in the Drake neighborhood. So um, getting involved with the neighborhood association, you know, I think they are really wanting to 
grow their relationship with students um, and with the Drake University community. Um, we are doing a lot right now around the Dogtown Business District. So uh, supporting those local businesses that are like two blocks away from you and then putting that on your own social media and um, just trying to get other people that you know to go and uh, eat at one of those restaurants or, or see a show at Lefties or um, XBK, um, making people aware of those assets that are kind of right there. Um, so those are, are ways that you could get directly involved in what we're doing right now. We like to curate our stuff. So if you're a little bit curious about art and healing and working with young people, maybe doing some, I mean, anything really. We, we just like to really um, get to know who you are and, and make sure that it aligns with your values and um, always tell people use art force as a stepping stone if it's not your landing if it's not your landing place it's okay to use it as a stepping stone so um, i'm going to drop my email in here as well and you can connect if you want to just explore and uh, if you're curious about what that could look like thank you so much i really appreciate how all the panelists have been open and vulnerable and okay about talking about what we what, what we call failures, but they really are those moments of learning and growth that allow us to do it better the next time. We couldn't do that if we didn't have those moments. It used to be such a taboo thing to talk about and the openness and transparency about it all, I think is making us such a better community and society to be able to move forward and do better. So um, thank you all for sharing. Thank you for sharing all of your expertise and experiences with us today. I can tell that people have gotten a lot out of this. And um, thank you for sharing your contact information too. So you may be hearing from some students about some follow up. Um, we have just a couple of one quick announcement, Crystal, if you want to put the last slide up, but first let's just thank our panelists of a uh, muted round of applause for everybody. <laughs> um, so I mentioned at the beginning of the panel, the Pathways for Civic Action and Social Change. We do have a survey tool available if students are interested in kind of figuring out what's their pathway, how do they want to get involved? Is it community organizing and activism? Or do you prefer to do something like policy and governance or direct service or philanthropy or social entrepreneurship? There's lots of different ways. Um, so you can take that survey and we also offer one-on-one -on -one meetings with peers. And I'm gonna pop um, the link in the chat box here so people can look into more, to that more. I'll send a follow-up email out um, just with some of the information from this evening. We do have a couple other panels this semester. And I think we have another slide for that too, Crystal. Maybe not. Um, we next, do not, sorry. Okay, no problem. <laughs> um, March 8th, we're going to have a panel on national service. So if you're interested in like AmeriCorps or Peace Corps, same time, uh, Tuesday, March 8th, and then I believe it's April 5th that Tuesday, we'll be having a panel on the direct service pathway. So if you're interested in more of that direct contact with people or maybe being a volunteer coordinator or something like that, then that would be a good panel for you too. So Thank you all so much for your time today. We will go ahead and conclude today's session. So thanks a lot, everybody. Have a great evening.